Well, last week I shared with you in the summer of 1984, my grandparents surprised me by buying me a brand new Mustang GT. Now, believe it or not, there is more to this story. Uh, Do you remember all of those great John Hughes movies of the 1980s where a nobody team became a somebody team teen overnight? Where a misfit teen found his way into the in crowd? By the end of the movie, he or she was voted homecoming king or queen. Or that person shared a romantic kiss with that person's dream person at the end of the movie. Do you remember 16 Candles and Pretty in Pink and Some Kind of Wonderful and Can't Buy Me Love, all those classic movies? Well, get this, that sort of happened to me when I drove that Mustang into that high school parking lot. All of a sudden, the cool kids invited me to eat lunch with them and go to their parties. And I'll never forget the day that the head cheerleader ditched her stud boyfriend, football player, to ask me for a ride home. I said yes, but being a gentleman, I didn't kiss her until after our first date. Now seriously, all these things happened to me in my imagination. (laughs) Just not in real life. In real life, a a few of the cool kids said, nice car, but it didn't change my status one bit. I remained in the same place I'd always been on the high school social ladder uh, moving forward. I I was mid-tier, mid-tier. I wasn't high enough to hang out with the cool kids. I wasn't so low that I got shoved into lockers by high school bullies. Mid-tier was not an incredibly exciting place to be in high school, but the good news was it was safe, and so that was all right with me. Well, for the past few weeks, we've been looking at a letter that a follower by the name of Jesus Christ, uh, by the name of Peter, uh, wrote to a group of Christians who are living in Asia Minor. Now, these individuals, the recipients of this letter, they were not fortunate enough to be mid-tier. They were bottom rung. Uh, Most of these individuals were from the slave caste or from the poor. They had zero status in their society. That, combined with their faith in Jesus Christ, resulted in them being at the brunt of some really, really poor treatment. And so Peter writes them a letter really to encourage them, but also to instruct them on how are you supposed to live in such a difficult environment? In the second chapter of Peter, 1 Peter, He sets out to encourage them by reminding them of who they truly are to God. These people may not have had any status in their communities, but in the kingdom of God, they were VIPs. And what was it exactly that gave them such special status? Well, it wasn't really so much what as it was who. In our society, status is determined by what? What do you look like? What's your title? What's your income bracket? What's on your resume? What do you own? The more impressive the answers to that question, the higher your status tends to be. But in the kingdom of God, what really has nothing to do in determining one's status? In the kingdom of God, it all comes down to who? These people had special status because they were in a relationship with Jesus Christ. And that's what really mattered. It was that connection. Now, to be clear, Jesus didn't have much status in his society as well, at least not for very long. In the end, he was crucified like a common criminal. But to God, there was no one of greater importance. And so Peter writes in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 4, As you come to him, the living stone, speaking of Jesus, rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him. This is what Peter wanted the believers to know, that although they were living in a society that made them feel like they were nothing, they were most precious to God because they were in relationship with Jesus Christ. And that's what he wants you to know as well. That regardless of your place in society or your lack of place, 
regardless of your place or lack of place in your work, at your school, in your home, you've got major status in the kingdom of God because of Jesus Christ. Now, to help us understand our status in the kingdom of God, Peter uses several descriptive terms in verse 9 of 1 Peter chapter 2. He writes this, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. Each of those terms is incredibly inspiring to think about. But just for the sake of time, I, I just want to touch on one. Peter refers to us as a royal priesthood. I want you to notice the pick on the screen. Does anybody know who this is? A few of you said it, right? Meghan Markle. This is a picture when she was an actress on the hit television show, Suits. Now, some of us knew Meghan Markle back then because we watched this television show. She was an actress. She had some status. But everything changed when she said, I do, to marrying this guy. Because just like that and saying, I do, she went from the status of being an actress, which, which is pretty impressive, to all of a sudden being a member of the royal family. And being a member of the royal family, she now has all the rights and privileges that comes with that particular position, I think. I'm not sure where it all stands right now in this particular family, but, but that's the concept anyway, right? And it illustrates what's taken place with many of us when we said, I do to Jesus Christ in baptism. That just like that, as we rose from the waters, we became a part of the heavenly courts. We are added to the family of the king of kings. It is an incredible rise in status. And the really cool thing about being a person of status is it brings with it some unique privileges. One of the great privileges of having status is it gives you access to what others do not have access to. My youngest son, Tate, was 15. He played in a baseball tournament in Omaha, Nebraska. It just so happened that that baseball tournament coincided with the opening weekend of the College World Series. And so we bought general admission tickets to the College World Series to one of those games. Now, for those of you who may not know, there's kind of a catch when it comes to general admission tickets to the College World Series. They sell 10,000 general admission tickets. They only have 5,000 general admission seats. Now, there's standing room only available, but even at that, not all 10,000 people who have bought tickets get in. You have to line up early and stand in line. Some of the parents and their kids got in. They actually got a seat. I was not one of them. I stood in line for over two hours in drizzling rain, only to be told at the halfway point, hey, you're probably not going to get in, and even if you do get in, it won't be until at least the fifth inning. Now, side note, my son got in, but that required ditching me, which he had no problem with. But that's another story. One of the fathers on the team, he and his son, they got in. And they got a seat right behind the third base dugout. In fact, they not only got in, they didn't even have to stand in line. They went early, they went into a special room, they got to eat some really good food, and then they walked out and they took their seat right there, prime position, behind the third base dugout. You say, how in the world did he pull that off? Bill was a big time exec for Wilson Sporting Goods. He had the type of status that gets you into places that preacher status does not get you into. <laughs> And so he was able to do that. Now, one of the things Peter wants us to know that as members of the royal court, we have status that gives us unique access. For this reason, he places the word priesthood next to the word royal. Because of our relationship with Jesus, we now have access to what was previously restricted to just a select few. For centuries, only priests enjoyed direct access to God. But now, because of our relationship with Jesus Christ, 
we too have direct access to the King of Kings. We can go before him anytime we want. We can go before him with confidence. We don't have to be nervous that he's going to say, you don't belong here, you don't deserve to be here, you need to leave. We get to go before him with confidence. The confidence that the writer of Hebrews speaks about in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 16, let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. That's no small privilege. The creator of the universe invites us to come before him any time of any day. And this change of status is huge, and this change of status should fill us with a sense of awe and gratefulness and inspire us to fulfill our responsibility. That's right, our change of status in Jesus Christ, it comes with responsibility. You say, what type of responsibility? Well, Peter goes on and shares that with us in verse 4 and 5 of chapter 2. He says, as you come to know him, or as you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood offering spiritual sacrifices to God through Jesus Christ. For centuries, God dwelt in this marvelous temple that was built by Solomon. But after his death and resurrection, he changed locales. And today, his dwelling place is within the church. As Peter makes clear, the church is not so much a place as it is a people. The structure of the church rests on Jesus. He is the chief cornerstone. And Peter quotes from Isaiah in in verse uh, 6 to make this point. He says, for in Scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone. Because Christ is holy, because Christ was raised from the dead, He is the perfect cornerstone. He is the perfect foundation for the rest of the church to be built upon. But Peter impresses upon us that we too are living stones who are being built into this marvelous house of God. And it's so cool to think about, isn't it? The one you are united with Christ in baptism, that God took you off the rock pile and he bonded you with other Christians by the, love of, by the blood of Jesus Christ to form this new house of God, the church. And now, just as this Old Testament priest offered animal and grain offerings at the temple to God, we, the royal priesthood, are to bring spiritual sacrifices to God as the church. Listen again to the words of Peter. You also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices to God through Jesus Christ. You say, what type of sacrifices? Well, all all different types of spiritual sacrifices that are mentioned in Scripture. Romans chapter 12, we are reminded that we are to offer our bodies as living sacrifices. Paul writes, therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. That's one type of spiritual sacrifice. But the spiritual sacrifice that Peter emphasizes, it's this expectation to make God known to make his goodness known, to make his faithfulness known, to make it known that it was part of God's plan to bring people back into relationship with him through the sacrifice of Jesus. That's what he wants us to really be about. And why is this so important that we fulfill this responsibility? Here's why. Because no matter how great of a status one might enjoy in this world, if he or she does not have a relationship with Jesus Christ, that person is going to miss out on God's blessings in the age to come. Peter wants us to know that Jesus is not one option among many to find your way back to God. He is it. 
Notice Peter strings together several quotes from Old Testament prophets really to show that Jesus is the cornerstone of God's plan. That everything God has done, that everything God is doing, that everything God will do in the future is built on the work of Christ. And specifically, he wants his audience to know that to reject or downplay Jesus will result in one's eternal downfall. Now, that message was not very PC in a society that engaged in the worship of many different gods, including emperor worship. It wasn't the type of message that keeps you out of trouble, but Peter didn't care because Peter understood that my status in the kingdom of God demands that I be about this work. And so he preached this type of message in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 6 through 8. For in Scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe, this stone is precious. But to those who do not believe, the stone the builder rejected has become the cornerstone. And a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. It wasn't a popular message then. It's not a popular message now. However, our status in the kingdom of God demands that we fulfill this responsibility. And so how exactly do we fulfill this responsibility? Well, I want you to notice that Peter mentions two ways to go about this. The first is this, is that we make God known through our words. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9 and 10. But you're a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Underline that word, declare. We are to be a praising people. It's one of the primary reasons that we do this every Sunday morning. We come together to remember and declare God's greatness. We come together to remember and declare God's faithfulness. We come together to remember and declare the work that Christ has done on our behalf to bring us into this royal family. That's why we do this. But this praising, this declaring, it's not to be reserved for a Sunday morning worship activity only. That every single day that we're going to be the type of people who share the character of God and the difference that He's made in our lives in our everyday conversations, right? It's a part of the mission that we talk about in making disciples, that we want to share Jesus. We want to live on mission. We want to teach and train in the ways of Jesus. And one of the most natural ways to go about this is simply to share the difference that Christ has made and continues to make in your life. In other words, you learn to tell your story. Now, here's the great news. Most people in this society, they like a good story. They'll listen to a good story, a personal story. They may not agree with everything in your story, but very rarely are people offended by a personal story. And so I want to encourage you to learn how to tell your story. You can learn how to tell your story basically by answering three simple questions. Number one, what was life like before I met Jesus? Or at least, what was life like before I got serious about a relationship with Jesus Christ? Question number two, how did I come to know Jesus? And then question number three is simply this, what, has, what difference has a relationship with Jesus Christ made in my life? Now, if you want to tell your story well, here's what I want to encourage you to do. I want you to write out those answers, all th the answers to all three questions. Just kind of get the story together and then edit. Edit, edit, edit. Get it down to where you can tell that story in three to five minutes. And just be ready to share it. Now, obviously, it's not good to force a spiritual conversation on anyone, right? Right? But Peter reminds us of this. We need to be willing and ready to share the reason for the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. 
He writes this in chapter 3 and verse 15, Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. And so we make God known through our words, but then we are also to make God known through our lives. He goes on in verse 11 and 12 and says, Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires, which wage war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Some people believe that Peter is saying this, that if we live a really good lifestyle, that there will be unbelievers who end up praising God on the day that Jesus returns. And, and I think that's right, but I also agree with those who say this, that there are going to be unbelievers who make the decision to become followers of Jesus Christ in the here and now because of a convicting lifestyle. And so how do you live a convicting lifestyle? Peter says that we really need to live a morally pure life. That's what he calls us to in verse 11 when he says to abstain from sinful desires. That if we're going to have an impact on other people's lives, we need to sin at least not as often as those who don't know Jesus. We need to do a little better than that, right? It's a huge challenge, but it's one that we can meet because of the resurrection power of Jesus. You see, when we are the type of people who exemplify that, that we're honest people, that we're compassionate, that we're generous, that we watch our words, that we treat people well, people begin to take note. And oftentimes the question is raised, why? Why do you live like this? Why are you different? I'm still reminded of Shaheen and Eden's story. If you talk to Eden, she'll say this, that she wasn't that interested in Christianity, but then she started to see how Shaheen's life was changing. She saw his life change. She became open to the Word of God. Now she's a disciple of Jesus. And this is what Peter's talking about, that when we change, people begin to notice. Now, just a side note, and it's simply this, is that it's important for us to live a morally good life because, well, because sin, it wages war on our soul. That sin's going to do its best to beat and batter that part of you that wants to relate to God. And so saying no to sin provides an opportunity for us to enjoy a vibrant, healthy relationship with Jesus Christ. And I raise that just to ask you to please consider, is there any particular sin in your life that's really got a grip on your life right now? And if so, I want to encourage you to just kind of own it and name it. And then I want you to confess and repent and say, you know, that's not the way I want to live. And I want to encourage you to seek out someone, someone who's not going to shame you. That's not the point. But someone who's going to support you as you seek to live a pure life, a life that's in step with the life that Jesus Christ calls you to live. That's the process that we're all in. And not only must we be a moral people, but we also must be a people who do good deeds. We say no to sin, but we say yes to improving this world. We should be a people who are actively known, who are striving to make our communities, our neighborhoods, our schools, our organizations, far better places. Listen, I'm absolutely convinced there are some people that you're not going to be able to change their opinion about Christians verbally. No matter what you say, they're going to believe that those who follow Jesus are prudes or they're hateful or they're bigots. You're not going to change their mind, but you can do this. You can live in such a good way that those accusations just don't stick. They don't stick. You see, it's hard to accuse a person of being unloving when love just oozes out of them. If ever there was a time that the church needs to ooze love, it's right now. It's right now. And so I want to leave you with this thought. Just think about this. The good that you decide to do this week, it very well may be what changes a person's status from unbeliever to interested or from interested 
to a person who's ready to study the Word of God. Or a person who's ready to study the Word of God to a disciple of Jesus Christ. And that's what we, as the royal priesthood, are to be all about.